Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Can, uh, right, time for the afternoon session. Uh, can I welcome you all again? Uh, especially those of you who've just come for the session. Uh, and above all, welcome Michael Lynch, a long standing friend of Manchester Seminars, uh, a leading uh, exponent of uh, ethnomethodology in contemporary period, and a very prominent practitioner in the field of. Uh, social Studies of Science, if you're not familiar with his work. There are several books and a multitude of papers. Uh, and you may, he's at Cornell, just in case you have to try and differentiate him from all the other lynches that a Google search will pop up. Um, uh, it, in, in conversation analysis recently, there's been a, a, a tremendous surge in interest in a topic called epistemics, if you're not familiar with the area. Uh, and it provides a, a kind of intendedly comprehensive scheme for analysing conversations mainly around the idea of knowledge. And Mike is going to discuss some features of this development. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Wes. And thank you, Phil and Marie, for setting this up and inviting me. Um, as Wes said, um, I'm going to be talking about this development that uh, is about uh, 10 years old in its most recent phase, at least, called epistemics or epistemics. Um, and um, uh, before I start, though, I'd, I'd like to uh, mention that uh, there's a group of us who are working on this topic that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, started uh, at the uh, the Ethnomethodology Institute meeting in um, Waterloo, Ontario, a year and a half ago. And the others are Doug McBeth, uh, Dean Wong, Wendy Sherman Heckler, Jonas Iverson, Oscar Lindwall, and Gustav, Gustav Leimer. So occasionally I'll go from the first person singular to the first person plural, uh, and it will uh, reference some of these others or implicate some of these others, I guess we could say. Um, in some ways, I'd rather be attacking um, Harry Collins. He's always much better, much more <laughs> fun doing that. But, uh, we will see how it goes uh, with, with this. Um, let me just pause for a bit and uh, give you some, <laughs> some uh, a long quote from an unpublished uh, paper book by Harold Garfinkel uh, with a long title that starts with uh, he specifies a, he re-specifies natural sciences, uh, discovering sciences of, uh, of practical action. Um, I thought it was appropriate for this uh, setting, uh, and in, in this long paper, he talks about an agreement between the Athenians and the Mancunians. Uh, and uh, I don't want to read every word of this, but he's basically talking about uh, uh, and proposing that ethnomethodology is making a move that differs from a very long-lasting tradition that he sometimes calls the classics, or uh, not just classical sociology, but uh, you know, a classical intellectual history, where uh, in this <coughs> case, he's talking about you know, the deep thinkers of Athens joined to the uh, practical reasoners of Manchester, both in the fields of technology and science, where they own the sort of privileged versions of the truth. And the truth is something that underlies the uh, most familiar, most unremarkable lived possessions of ordinary activities. And of course, ethnomethodology <coughs> treats them to its particular uh, mode of practice. Um, and in contradistinction to this idea that there's nothing uh, of intellectual interest in ordinary language, uh, ordinary actions, that it takes analysis, it takes a professional uh, or uh, disciplined form of analysis to dig out from under the, the ordinary, what the, the kernel of truth, the essential uh, organization of it is. I'll be returning to this, but I want to have this as background for uh, what will be a criti critical discussion of this move in epistemics, where apparently, the epistemics is doing exactly what Garfinkel says here, turning attention to the, the ordinary, ordinary conversation, 
and finding in ordinary conversation uh, mechanisms for the distribution of knowledge. And uh, what I want to do is to uh, open up that question to see whether indeed they do manage to follow along with what uh, Garfinkel was saying at the methodology does, or whether they revert to the agreement between the Athenians and the Mancunians. Um, Garfinkel, again in the same text, credits Egon Fittner with uh, this phrase that the plain creatures, that is, reason, rules, evidence, demonstration, each for the suffix, in and as the work of the streets, went away to college and came back educated. Uh, uh, and then he says, after the Greeks, you never recognized them. And at the methodology program, as he announced it in the late 80s and 90s, uh, early 90s, uh, uh, would turn to what he called the work of the streets, which included in studies of laboratories and workplaces, the ordinary quotidian work of the workplace. It wasn't as if the Mancunian's place, the laboratory, the shop, was off limits to ethnomethodology, but when it was opened up to ethnomethodology, the issue was the day-to-day -day unremitting real-time activities. Um, now, I've used the term epistopics in the past uh, to describe these terms, you know, these big issues of rules, evidence, demonstration, reason, and so forth, as topics that are addressed in ethnomethodology, topics of order, topics of, of uh, reasonable conduct. Uh, but the issue there is not to, as we've seen in a number of uh, sort of uh, uh, sociological, anthropological, and other developments uh, of uh, empirical philosophy, it's not to find metaphysics in the everyday. It's instead to find the mundane uses, the everyday uses of these terms that have been you know, dressed up and gone to college, educated. So it's, it's not to re-educate them by finding them in the ordinary, it's instead to find them as ordinary constitutive activities. Um, okay. um, just to connect this, uh, obviously some of you were, quite a few of you are philosophers, um, and uh, I hope that I don't uh, get too technical on you with uh, some of this study of language. Um, the connection to the sorts of mind and society issues, such as in uh, uh, Hutchinson, Reed, and Sharrock's book on there's no such thing as a social science. I don't think they have a question mark after that, do they? Um, that uh, there's a connection to that kind of program where finding a misbegotten uh, philosophy uh, being what weaved into uh, sociological analysis, uh, and, and that book was uh, an explication of Peter Winch. Epistemics is a bit different, but I think that some of the issues that we find with uh, uh, you know, the metaphysization of uh, the everyday also happens with this, but it's not very metaphysical, it's very empiricist. Um, uh, and there's a number of terms that we associate with philosophical programs like epistemology. Epistemics is in the hands of the people I'll be talking about, uh, like pragmatics, it's like a linguistics. There's also a term that's used by a number of uh, Finnish and other uh, researchers in studies of language, use deontics um, to do with authority. And, uh, and there's also something on benefactives that uh, claim and heritage have uh, dealt with, where it uh, takes a term, uh, you, you know, whether it was initially an adjective, turns it into a noun, uh, empiris, em, em, empirically investigates it as a kind of domain of language use, and uh, treats it technically uh, as, uh, a, a, in some ways, a branch of linguistics. Um, the program I'll be talking about examines how information or knowledge is distributed in communicative actions and interaction, um, and it's connected to a larger sociological uh, sociology of knowledge theme of the distribution of knowledge, how knowledge spreads or does not spread in a society, and dealing with it in a very uh, intimate way in conversations, usually dyadic conversations between pairs of people, but also family uh, in larger groups, but mostly you'll see it in dyads. Uh, and the key issue is the uh, 
production, identification, and characterization of social actions in language, in and through language. It's related to the notion of accountability from Garfinkel, that is the reportable, observable production of, uh, of, of social interaction and order in society, in, insofar as what we're dealing with is uh, how social actions become uh, identified as such, as what they are, in interaction, and I'll return to that theme in a minute. Um, the issue is to try to tie together what uh, Manny Shakeloff once called spectator analysts, that is people looking at videotapes or listening to audio tapes or reading transcripts of somebody else's conversation, with arguably what the participants in these uh, videotapes, audio tapes, and so forth are doing together. And so it's that, that joining of analysis done from outside with the internal, intrinsic production of order that's of that issue. Um, and so this idea of production of recognizable actions in conversation, in social interaction, is the, uh, the, 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 the nut they're trying to crack in this analysis of action formation. Um, what I hope to address uh, is uh, how the epistemic program, as we're calling it, relates to ethnomethodological conversation analysis, particularly on the production and recognizability of actions produced in interaction with or produced in situ. And it's, we're looking at the relation between participants' understandings in and as conversation, that is, produced through their actions together, and what the spectator and analyst is doing. Um, and the question, as I raised earlier, is does EP, as I'm calling it, epistemic program, revert to the agreement between the Athenians and the Mancunians? That is, finding in the surface of the uh, actions an underlying order that makes sense of it, whether or not it's known or be known to the participants. The question that I think will be a question, I hope, for discussion rather than something that I will answer definitively is uh, if the answer is that there is this reversion to uh, <coughs> the agreement between the Athenians and the Mancunians, if the answer is yes, then what prospect is there for epistemic and for methodological conversation analysis? Now, um, that one might accuse me of doing the sorts of things that ethnomethodologists have been accused of probably quite fairly in the past, which is uh, pick your poison, the, uh, you know, in Monty Python's life, life on Dry and the endless arguments between the People's Front of Judea and the Judea People's Front. I mean, am I making uh, fun distinctions? And there's this lovely cartoon from the New Yorker a few months ago where. Uh, if you can see the flags, uh, there can be no peace until they pronounce their rabbit god and accept our duck god. So um, um, I hope it doesn't come to this, but um, <laughs> there, there's always that possibility. So um, <laughs> as I said, we've had these informal discussions. We've been meeting every month, uh, and most recently every two weeks via Skype with various combinations of us, plus some others who uh, have joined in from time to time. Um, and we're planning a session at the uh, International Institute for Ethnomethodology and Conversation Analysis in Denmark. Uh, our group was joined by a sociolinguist named uh, Jean Wong uh, in recent months. And she's been very active in uh, our reading scads of stuff on epistemics and discussing it and trying to come to terms with it. Um, my initial puzzlement was this in, in dropping in on these conversations and then getting very active with them is that, um, and which as I say here is developed into a, co a conviction, is that there's something puzzling about the epistemic program. It seemed initially, and it seems even more uh, as I uh, get into more of it, incompatible with the fundamental com commitments of that the methodological CA let alone ethnomethodology, and I'll explain what I mean by ethnomethodological CA in a minute. The CA means, of course, conversation analysis. <coughs> what this talk is not meant to be is a critique of conversation analysis as an entire field. I 
mention that because about 20 years ago, I, uh, David Bogan and I, and also to some extent Dushan Bialic and I, wrote a few pieces that were quite critical of CA on quite fundamental grounds. Uh, we're, at this point, framing things a little more narrowly. We're looking at what we see to be commit commitments in CA that weren't just there at the beginning when Harvey Sachs, the founder of the field, was still alive. He died uh, 40 years ago this year. Um, but uh, that are, to some extent, still invoked, including by some of the major uh, proponents of the epistemic program, and especially these days invoked by Manny, Manny Shagoff, who's still the, the leading figure in it, uh, when he's now retired from UCLA. Um, so it's not a matter of contrasting the old nostalgic view of conversation analysis with this program that we're going to talk about. Um, it's something that uh, I believe and arguably is still very much programmatically and to some extent analytically part of the field. So I'm not trying to discredit uh, conversation analysis, and although I'll be talking about John Heritage and his work um, quite uh, extensively, it's not an attempt to discredit him personally. Uh, it's a discussion of his work, uh, some of it collaborative, much of it uh, under his own uh, name, uh, single authored, because he's a leading authority on the subject. It's sort of his baby, and uh, we can't avoid talking about him when we talk about uh, this work. Um, so what do I intend to do? What is this? Um, Again, I want to be questioning how the, epi the epistemic program and related programs in conversation analysis, they proliferating, um, how they relate to distinctive epistemic commitments. So one of the handles we're putting on this session, we're putting together is the epistemics of epistemics. It sounds a little bit too cute. But um, again, we're, we're looking at commitments expressed by people like Manny Shagloff and upheld in CA. It's a difficult argument to make, to bring off, because uh, the major publications we'll be talking about by Heritage and others link their arguments quite explicitly, Garfinkel, Sachs, Shagloff, and occasionally Wittgenstein, Schutz, Winch, Lauch, and others. So it's not as though they bypassed that uh, lineage. Uh, nevertheless, there's an absence of critical discussion of the, ethics, the epistemics program in the uh, CA literature. There are some commentaries, there are seeds of criticism, but we have to kind of like pull them out of uh, occasional formulations that are uh, presented not as criticisms, but as discussions or uh, points made in passing. Um, Shagloff's vision of CA is our strongest point of leverage, but we wouldn't <coughs> expect him to sign on to what we're doing. Um, and so we have this, this kind of hard case to make, which is, to recruit as allies people who will want to disown us. Um, that's my guess. Maybe if they want to join in, that's, then we'd be delighted. Um, so what's at stake? Um, the, the stake is a, a big claim in a, the methodology. It goes back to this quote with which I started with Garfinkel. Uh, it may be a uh, you know, pipe dream. Um, but it's something that recruited me into the field, recruited many of us into the field, which is that ethnomethodology offers a very different vision of the production of social order than we find in sociology, the social sciences, and even the grand intellectual traditions. You could call it Western, but probably it's more than that. Um, and again, I'm uh, plugging this book by Hutchinson at all, with, uh, you know, lining up with Winch, uh, to some extent with Louch, uh, certainly with Wittgenstein, to radically question, radically look for an alternative to uh, not only social science, but very dominant analytic traditions of philosophy. So let me do a little bit about what I call, uh, or I'm sure I'm not the first one to use this term, ethnomethodological conversation analysis. Um, again, it goes back to this agreement between the Athenians and the Mancunians. And uh, there are various statements you could pull out of key writings by Sachs, by Shagloff, and by others, which point to how uh, leading analytical figures in philosophy and social sciences see in quotidian expressions uh, meaningless or useless analytical devices unless they are somehow translated or transformed into or underlain by theoretically postulated or analytically methodologically disciplined constructions that allow for analysis. Uh, 
some of the quotes that we could take uh, from Sachs. There's some wonderful quotes in uh, a book, uh, a paper that was taken out of his lectures and published in uh, the Atkinson <coughs> Heritage book in uh, Reader from 1984. Uh, and this point is that my, he says, my research is about conversation only in this incidental way, that conversation is something that we can get the actual happenings on tape and we can get more or less transcribed as conversation is simply something to begin with to characterize uh, the constitutive uh, character of social interaction and producing social order. Um, and then uh, a line from Garfinkel, that same text from which I was quoting earlier, He's talking about worksite specific coherence of detail. And by worksite, we could mean, in this case, uh, you know, any place where activities are done routinely in some organized way uh, but that have a coherence of detail. Uh, and it's, uh, he's saying here, consistent with what so Sachs is saying, arguably, that it can't be found without talk, since talk is ubiquitous in many activities, not all activities, but many. Um, and um, uh, but it's not in the talk. It's not as though the talk is the action or the source or the driver of action uh, in all of these cases where we find order. Um, and um, uh, he then goes on about embodied work site specific constructively reproducible genetic sequences and fly machines. Uh, I like that last line best. Um, so what I mean by ethnomethological CA is not a branch grafted onto existing socio and psycholinguistics programs. It's not grafted, on, grafted onto existing sociology. It's not grafted onto any social sciences. It's starting out at a different starting point. It's not a professional methodology to which, uh, and I quote from one of the articles that's in the uh, deontics domain, key ideas have emerged from the inductive data-driven conversation analytic process. And I believe by conversation analytic process they mean professional analysts analyzing uh, talk to find in, in that talk order through some empiricist methodology. Um, again, kind of preliminaries, uh, a couple of quotes from Shagloff, which I think uh, have some connection to this uh, uh, opposition or alternative to the agreement of the uh, uh, Athenians and Mancunians. Um, from an article written uh, in 1996 uh, in the American Journal of Sociology. Uh, Shagloff talks about uh, discipline study of actual action. Particular actions have been curiously absent from sociological inquiry and discourse. He adds that they appear to be virtually epiphenomenal expressions of underlying factors, processes, and variables, norms, rationality, conformer, conformity, power, system functions, and the like. But important largely is the public face and the accessible display an indicator of those underlying forces. He then, uh, in this article and some others, he turns his attention to Goffman and he says even for Goffman, actions are cast as the official or ostensible version of what's going on, a veil whose penetration and revelation is the true calling of the sophisticated, perspicuous sociologist or anthropologist but in these quarters, no more attention was given than any elsewhere to whatever persons might be thought or observed in the first instance to be doing. And, and in these quarters refers to Goffman's work, particularly the earlier work on you know, the presentation of self, where uh, the <laughs> surface of action has behind it uh, you know, a self that is manipulating signs and symbols, and it's the perspicuous uh, or the perspicacity of the uh, analyst that delves into that, and of course, uh, uh, Goffman is brilliant at that kind of unmasking operation. Um, and another quote from uh, Shagloff, if, if we are to get clear on uh, how the actions people do with talk are transparently what they are, that is on the surface, we will have to make analytically explicit how they are constructed to be transparently that, or equivocally that, for that matter, and how they may therefore be recognizable as transparently, uh, as uh, recognizable as transparently that or equivalently that, both to the recipients and derivatively to academic analysts. So he's being very clear about this difference. Uh, and uh, Gene Wall uh, should be thanks for finding that quote from me the other day. Uh, so now here's how action formation, this idea of the recognizability of actions, 
is translated into a problem for uh, the epistemic program. A couple of years ago, in the journal Research on Language and Social Interaction, better known as RALSI, uh, they devoted part of an issue to a couple of articles by Heritage and uh, commentaries by Paul Brew and uh, Jack Sidnell. Uh, so ate up a fair uh, chunk of article. And um, these articles very heavily read and cited, as well as some earlier articles by Heritage and uh, Jeffrey Raymond. Um, so the, the problem, as Heritage construes it, and also you can find this similarly construed in uh, Levinson's, uh, you know, Levinson's very prominent social psychologist and uh, uh, you know, pragmatics uh, linguist. Uh, both of them, Levinson's writing in the Handbook of Conversational Analysis, he wrote the chapter on action formation. Their problem starts with an article that uh, 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 Shagloff wrote in the 1970s that was published in, again, the Atkinson Heritage Reader in 1984. And in that article, Shagloff produced a demonstration that uh, if you isolate sentences from conversation and characterize them in terms of, say, speech act theory, you're going to get it wrong. Uh, things that look like a question taken in isolation will sometimes act as a request, an invitation, or some other action when placed in sequential context. And that apparently was quite an effective demonstration, not only for people in conversation analysis, but also for linguists who found that indeed they could not characterize single utterances in terms of their syntactic or other grammatical form as isolated sentences, but instead had to look for the uh, situated, uh, occasioned use of gram grammatical forms and other aspects of uh, communication in uh, situated conversation. Uh, now the problem, as Heritage formulates it, is that um, for uh, utterances that come in pairs, like questions and answers, principally, but also things like greetings, return greetings, or uh, invitations, and either uh, you know acceptance or refusal, and so forth, that in the pair utterances, you wouldn't know what the first one is doing until you look at the second one. And actually, Shagloff has talked about that as kind of a, a confirmatory proof criterion to look at the response to an utterance to kind of confirm an analytic characterization of what not only what it is, but what it's doing. Right? Um, so the problem then is how do you characterize firsts, right? Or how do you find in firsts the, the identifying uh, uh, properties of the utterance aside from how it's response, responded to? Now, I, I'm putting problem in quotes because I don't see that to be a problem, right? I see it to be uh, a, a claim that Shagloff makes about interaction, about the forms of utterances in inter interaction, but it's being turned into a problem for linguistics to characterize first utterances aside from how they are responded to because uh, otherwise it seems to leave things uh, undefined. And as Levinson puts it, uh, he sees it to be the soft underbelly of uh, conversation analysis that it makes loose, intuitive characterizations of exact uh, of actions embodied in terms. And these characterizations are, is, quote, largely based on our knowledge as societal members or conversational practitioners. And indeed, that's true, but it's, <laughs> it's sort of the sine qua non of conversation analysis rather than the loose underbelly, although some of us do have loose underbellies. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it comes with the territory. Um, but, um, uh, and, and so it, it's an odd switch, a kind of gestalt switch on what was the uh, uh, alternative to this agreement between the, uh, the Athenians and the Mancunians is now being turned into a problem, right? A, something has to be overcome through a more <coughs> disciplined form of analysis. And in one of the two papers in Ralsey in 2012, Heritage offers a kind of a solution. And the solution is that you can characterize with very, uh, well, first of all, start with um, uh, a particular kind of adjacency pair, uh, interrogatives or declaratives and their responses, uh, and call that uh, information requests or information uh, uh, 
asserting utterances uh, and, and treat that as ubiquitous. He doesn't say that it's, it's everywhere, but it's nearly ubiquitous in conversation that you can sort of map out interrogatives, declaratives, and their responses in conversation, and this happens. And it, it's this particular uh, sequence that he's talking about in this uh, article that, um, you know, if you start with Shankoff's problem, you then say that uh, uh, this, there's this ubiquitous kind of pairing of utterances, uh, information sharing, information giving uh, utterances, uh, the linguistic form as characterized in morphosyntactic syntactic form, if it's supplemented by uh, analytic uh, attributions of epistemic status and epistemic stance, uh, you can solve this problem of action formation. Now, epistemic status is what one speaker knows and knows or does not what the other knows about targeted information. I'll give some sequences so that this doesn't seem overly abstract. And stance is a distinction between, between what somebody actually does know or, or should know, what right they have rights to know, and what they apparently know from the way they talk. Right? And of course, there are times when people will pr uh, present uh, or make an assertion about something that they don't actually know about and pretend to know about. So there's, there's a distinction to be made there. Um, and so the, uh, this epistemic gradient has to do with, if you just take it in dyadic terms, one speaker talking to an interlocutor, there's a difference in what they know about the targeted matter uh, at hand. Right? So somebody's announcing that their sister had a baby girl. Um, they know about that. They have rights to know about that. And the person they're telling to presumably hasn't yet learned that. So there's this gradient of that particular knowledge. And it's diagrammed in uh, Eric Lynch. Uh, calls it the epistemic gradient and the dynamic between it, sometimes called the epistemic seesaw. <laughs> and, you know, seesaw, I don't know if that's a term used in British English. No, it's a, yeah, okay. Uh, and um, also, the uh, participants in conversation apparently have an epistemic ticker, that is, they are paying attention to what and each of them knows about the subject at hand. And uh, you can, well, not you, but heritage and the epistemics crew code or characterize the speaker and the recipient in terms of knowledge plus, they know something about the matter at hand, or knowledge minus, they know rel relatively less, less, and then the uh, degree of difference is this gradient, right? Sometimes they know a lot more, sometimes they know a little bit more, sometimes they know about the same. So the structure of the argument in Heritage's uh, papers, uh, particularly the 2012 one, but also going back to the first paper where they use this term, uh, epistemics, um, is that uh, uh, firsts, whether they're the f uh, an assessment of a topic at hand or a, a question or um, assertive utterance, uh, has a status as higher or lower in terms of this gradient. Um, and first pair parts, whether they're informings or interrogatives, that uh, have these various forms, declarative syntax, declarative syntax with rising intonation, tag questions, negative inter interrogative syntax, interrogative syntax, you know, these basic you know, linguistic uh, syntactic form, will index what the speaker knows or presumes relative to the recipient. Um, and the epistemic gradient can be used and is used in these articles to assign ubiquitous motivation that disambiguates the equivocal status of the firsts as characterized linguistically as isolated sentences. And that's the problem that's raised by Shapov's article. So when you add this epistemic element to it, this domain, you then supposedly disambiguate this problem with characterizing things in terms of syntax. <coughs> uh, there's also this issue comes out of Goffman of territories of knowledge uh, in the motivation of interactional se sequences. That's again Heritage's uh, uh, language from another article in this same special issue called the epistemic engine. Um, and uh, Heritage 
argues that when a speaker indicates that there is an imbalance or of information between speaker and hearer, this indicates uh, this indication is sufficient to motivate and warrant a sequence of interaction that will be closed when the imbalance is acknowledged as equalized for all practical purposes. He uses a hydraulic model, not Freud's hydraulic, hydraulic model, but the idea that with this gradient you have a kind of flow of information that seeks equilibrium, right? So the feet of power comes to rest. Okay, I hope you're not all dazing out on this stuff yet. But, um, here's a table uh, in this article about action formation. You get different um, orders of uh, uh, you know, uh, syntax, you know, declarative sentence types, declarative syntax with rising intonation, which, um, although the, the words seem to be formed in the terms of assertion, the rising intonation uh, indicates a kind of questioning. Tag questions like, is that so? At the end of a, an assertion, negative interrogative syntax and interrogative syntax, again, indicating uh, when viewed in isolation, um, a particular stance or a particular status with respect to uh, the epistemic issue at hand. Um, so here's some of the examples. Uh, just using a very short example about you're married or not, uh, a declarative would be you're married. Uh, interrogative would be are you married? Tag questions would be, you're married, aren't you? Declarative syntax is rising intonation. You're married. Um, negative interrogative syntax, are you not married? Um, so that, uh, according to Shagla, uh, Shagla, Heritage, the same propositional content is being reworked in these uh, syntactic uh, forms, uh, expressing different epistemic stance encoded, as he puts it, in the grammar of these sentences. And it's quite different. And then epistemic status, he claims, is fundamental in determining that actions are or are not requests for information. Okay. Um, an example of this um, is a declarative, right, a, an assertion um, <coughs> that addresses a matter that is within the recipient's epistemic domain, that is, something that in the context of the other, it should be presumed something that they would be knowing about. In other words, it would be their right to know this in some sense of right. Uh, the epistemic status, therefore, is a primary condition for the mutually understood and enacted upon sequential import of the utterance. So that the form of the utterance is kind of a precondition, right? But it doesn't determine its functioning in the sequence unless you take account of this differential uh, stance status rights to the knowledge in question. So this is a doctor-patient uh, uh, you know, exchange. Uh, the doctor is asking, are you married? Uh, the patient says no. A little bit of background information is that the uh, patient has a daughter, and the doctor knows this. Uh, and so the doctor then does what Heritage calls a uh, you know, next best guess, which is that you're divorced currently, and she agrees. Um, and so you can see that the functioning then would be informed by the fact that she has a daughter, as well as these uh, syntactic forms. So uh, requirements for running this engine, right, for uh, making this kind of analysis, is that uh, the analyst has to assign epistemic status to the speaker and recipients, independent of the epistemic stance. Right? So it's not just a question of what they apparently say, in the form of the words they use in the context, but what you can presume they know and know of each other um, for a targeted state of affairs, and that's how Heritage puts it. So what is being referred to, applied, known in common, understood to be an issue for the speaker and recipients is what is this idea of the targeted state of affairs. Um, so what I then want to question about this is that uh, and this is a criterion that Chegloff uh, raises, and I agree with, which is that aside from whatever preliminary things or arguments we may want to make about this, does the, the interpretation that uh, Heritage and others are making pass the test of the adequacy of the description of some practice, right? Uh, and that is its capacity to yield con 
convincing analysis of singular episodes of conversation. Right? So what we want to look at then uh, uh, are specific instances in these articles published on uh, epistemics. Uh, for sake of time, I'll look at about four of them. But um, um, there are many others, and I invite you, uh, if you care, to read the several articles on this, and uh, um, you will see many other examples, and you can form your own opinion of it, which is, uh, you know, a uh, virtue of conversation analysis that there is a presentation of the evidence that is used, at least some of the evidence that's used, to make claims. Also important is epistemic status is assigned, right? So it's not just a matter of looking at the form of utterances, it's discerning what people know who are making these assertions. So uh, some of the surface features of utterances are said to index epistemic status. So Heritage for the last 30 years has written about the token O, and he calls it a change of state token. He sometimes uses that to uh, index a change of state from K plus to K minus. So if somebody says something to you and you go, oh, you are uh, indexing that you've gone from not knowing to knowing, right? Um, so actually the transformation would be from K minus to K plus, but in the case of O. Um, <coughs> background, uh, sometimes the word loosely is used ethnographic, that is a little bit of background information about who the speakers are, who they are to each other, are they sisters, do they talk a lot, do they, what do they know about each other, will be used to inform the uh, specific sequences that are um, in the case, such as in as I showed before, there was a mother and a daughter. The fact that she had a daughter was part of the reasoning that would go into the analysis of the uh, uh, exchange. Um, notions of rights and entitlements to information and experience are used. Now, Harvey Sachs wrote to some extent about these things. Uh, some of the issues that come into play, and as far as I know, they're, they're always characterized in a rather general way. Um, we're presumed to know about our own lives, our own, about our own experiences, about our own families, about our own dogs, about our own uh, occupational domains of expertise, uh, uh, you know, things that we are known to be uh, skilled at, practiced at, uh, informed about, and so forth, are part of these issues. There's also uh, uh, a difference made between hearsay evidence and directly witnessed evidence. So. Um, if somebody has come back from a trip, they are presumed to know what they did on the trip, and who they tell it to doesn't know directly what they were talking about. So there's these sorts of uh, commonplace uh, resources that are brought into play both by the analyst and presumably by the speakers when they work out who knows what about what. Um, so what we want to look at is how the tracks for this epistemic engine, this this. That, that incessantly operates through uh, you know, sequences of uh, inter interrogatives and uh, uh, assessments and uh, questions and so forth. Um, and uh, interestingly, we can take what Levinson said about the loose hermeneutics of CA and apply it to the assignment of epistemic status. How do you assign as an analyst you know, what somebody knows? It's often not at the surface. It's something that is brought into play to inform the analysis uh, in a way that's not directly apparent through what uh, is said. Um, now, the papers that uh, we've been reading include numerous instances, as many as 50 in one article, often the same instances that are drawn upon through several articles. And these instances index collections that aren't shown directly in the articles, but the test uh, is the plausibility of the analyst's action interpretation. That is what they see the action to be occurring in a given sequence, regardless of what they may have in terms of uh, you know, large corpuses of uh, transcribed materials. So I'll give you a small sample. Um, here's um, a case from the Heritage and Raymond article, it's about uh, assessments and assessments that follow each other. Um, and there's a, a short, short sequence and also a rather brief characterization of it. 
Um, they present an, an exchange. Um, it's one that you know is not particularly esoteric, um, in which um, the uh, J, the first speaker, uses a tag question, isn't it? Um, to downgrade a declaratively produced assessment of the weather, thereby indexing the similar rights available to a co-present participant. My understanding of that, to put it very simply, is they both know what the weather is. They both presume that the other knows the weather. They're not talking on the phone from, say, Manchester to California. They're talking on the phone or directly face-to-face. -face. They both have equal access to the weather, right? They have equal access to assess the weather. Now, the uh, I put in red, uses of a tag question to downgrade, downgrade relative to the way this might otherwise be put, is my understanding of this. That is, uh, this could be said, it's a beautiful day, with a straight assertion, rather than it's a beautiful day out, isn't it? So the downgrade is, the isn't it is downgraded relative to a more direct, unqualified assertion. That's what I understand downgrade to mean. And then in analyzing this further, uh, L agrees with Jay's assessment while simply declining to assert primary rights in the matter. Okay. Now I highlighted that because I find that to be interesting uh, and problematic. So um, you might think this is a fairly uh, banal exchange. It's a beautiful day out, isn't it? Yeah, it's just gorgeous, gorgeous right? It's agreement. Maybe an art, uh, maybe gorgeous is an upgrade of uh, beautiful or about the same, whatever. Um, but the analysis is asserting that L declines to do something else, right? So she does say, yeah, it's just gorgeous in apparent agreement with L, but she declines to assert primary rights in the matter, meaning that she doesn't say, what do you mean it's a beautiful day out? What do you know about the day? All right. <laughs> Something of that sort is, is in the background. So something that didn't happen is being declined in something that happens. Okay. Um, here's another one from the same article um, in which a second speaker, again, I'm quoting from the uh, lead into this, and this is about as far as the analysis go. I'm not just taking a small piece of their analysis because these articles have lots of examples. This is a short example. It's dealt with rather quickly. A second speaker struggles to find a basis for affiliating with a first assessment whose very construction, you should see that house, Emma, denies the access necessary for building an agreement. Okay? Again, it may look a banal to you, right? Jesus Christ, you see that house, Emma. You have no idea. I bet it's a dream, right? Um, so, Emma is somehow struggling to find a basis for affiliating to this understanding. Now, we can make out, just with this isolated sequence, that Lottie has seen the house, Emma has not, right? Emma is finding a way to agree with that by saying that it's a dream, right? So her, her utterance is formed in a way that doesn't, pre doesn't uh, presume to have seen the house. Right? She goes, she, she takes the word for it, and agrees as best she can. Um, so the analysis that projects an agreement with Lottie's assessment of the house while simultaneously thematizing her lack of first-hand experience, lacking that experience, she manages raw affiliation with Lottie's evaluation of utterance that expresses at best a simulacrum of agreement. Um, here, uh, the problem is what is agreement, right? What is a genuine agreement? What is a simulacrum agreement? We can see that there's a, a, you know, a difference in presumed, presented access to this particular house. Uh, the analysis complicates it, and complicates it with notions of rights and uh, uh, a struggle that I don't see to be happening. So, but again, read this, make up your own mind. This is as much as I have to go on. Um, here's another one that's reproduced in three different articles, maybe more. Uh, again, coming, these are, some of these have been tapes that have been around in the corpus uh, of CA work for over 40, sometimes 50 years. Um, 
So Emma and Lottie again. Um, Emma, how was your trip? This is a phone call. Uh, a little bit of background information. You can make it out from the uh, transcript probably. Lottie has come back from Palm Springs in a resort area outside Los Angeles. They live in the Los Angeles area. Uh, Emma has called her, or at least is on the phone with her, is asking her about the trip, and Lottie says, oh God, wonderful, Emma. And then Emma comes in with, oh, isn't it beautiful down there? And then Lottie, oh Jesus, it was gorgeous. Okay? Now it is an interesting uh, sequence in that she finds a way to, not having been on the trip, uh, finds a way to agree with, uh, you know, how wonderful Palm Springs is by shifting with it from the trip to the site of the trip, the destination of the trip. Um, so, in um, Heritage and Raymond, say that this exchange points to the use of an O prefacing as a means of countering the recipient's upgraded <coughs> claim of access to a referent that began as the speaker's information preserved. Kind of reminiscence of Goffman. Right? This, you know, the trip is her domain. It's her trip. She knows about the trip. It's her experience. She has rights to that experience. Emma doesn't. Right? It would be kind of absurd if Emma were to presume rights to being on a trip she didn't go along in. Um, so, uh, this, but the term countering, and also in another article, uh, turning the epistemic tables turns this into kind of a competition, right? You see it forming as a, uh, a you know, who has rights to talk about what. Uh, this is a matter of like claiming rights to talk where presumably she didn't have such rights to begin with, so it's turning the tables. Uh, a bit of a you know, competitive scenario. Uh, we see this sort of stuff in you know, graduate seminars, but um, you know, they're talking about Palm Springs on the vacation. Um, so we get this competitive claim to privacy uh, and this turning of epistemic tables. Okay? Um, and again, there's this background of rights to evaluate, rights to assess. Uh, last one. Um, the transcript might be a little bit tough for you to read. Uh, I believe it's uh, accented uh, English. Uh, it's a court case. Uh, a plaintiff is presenting to an arbitrator a, um, a complaint about uh, a, what do you call it, a laundry, a press, or something went badly wrong. And uh, the plaintiff is trying to get the arbitrator to agree that uh, about, about how the operation of this uh, press works, this laundry press. Um, so he, the plaintiff says, I mean, I think of myself, if they put it on one of their steam things, right? Uh, pause of almost a second. Uh, and start pressing it, don't they? Another pause. See what they use? They, they don't use an iron, do they? The arbitrator finally comes in. Well, perhaps you can get Mr. Collins, who is the defendant, to tell us about that. So he's you know, declining to answer. Um, and then uh, the targeted is these uh, these two utterances. Um, um, and um, according to Heritage, um, they propose dry cleaning involves steam pressing, as, uh, and they have a tag question. Uh, these remarks do not encode a K minus position on this matter relative to the arbitrator. Uh, again, looking at epistemic status to make out what the syntactic form is doing in this particular uh, utterance. They're designed to entice an affirmative response from the arbitrator who ultimately rule on the damages involved. Understandably, the arbitrator resists this enticement by referring to the defendant's expertise on the question. Again, uh, using these um, assignments of uh, epistemic rights to make out the <coughs> sort of drama of the uh, uh, exchange. Okay, so um, assessing, not assessments, as they did, but the uh, way in which these uh, particular singular instances are interpreted, um, there's kind of ad hoc use of assumptions about the ubiquity of information, information exchange, information preserves, and competitive motivations and orientations. I mean, that's kind of a framing of uh, many instances, and not just singular, it's one or just a few. Uh, now, these things, of course,
course, occur occasionally. You know, people do have competitive talk occasionally, competitive talk about who knows what. Uh, but these are treated as ubiquitous in uh, exchanges of this sort, where information is being passed and information exchange itself is viewed as ubiquitous. Background understandings supplied by listening to extended uh, transcripts or other uh, understandings of who the people are with one another uh, are used to inform what they are doing in particular of the talk. Um, and then distributional <coughs> patterns, and by distributional patterns I mean in collections of hundreds of instances, frequencies of different moves of possible moves are used to kind of inform uh, sometimes normatively what uh, the possibilities are. And then tokens like particularly O are used as indexes of underlying states and statuses. Um, in my view, uh, you can make up your own mind about this, uh, these interpretations seem to miss or add little to what otherwise seems apparent or un to untutored, so-called intuitive understanding of the, of the exchanges. Um, speaking of collections, I haven't done much about this, but I'm, I'm reminded of a, I'm not a big friend of Karl Popper, um, but uh, there was one thing he said uh, about the psychiatry of uh, Adler, the system, that I think uh, can lead us to reflect on how uh, these collections are formed and used to inform particular cases. Um, <coughs> talk, uh, Popper talks about how he initially was taken by Adler's uh, psychiatry, and uh, he had this encounter with Adler to kind of turn him around. And he said that he reported to him a case which seemed to go contrary to Adler's theory, but Adler very quickly turned it around and assimilated it to his own theory. And uh, when questioned by Popper uh, how he could be so sure about this, he says, because of my thousandfold experience, then Popper replies, uh, uh, and with this new case, I suppose your experience has become a thousand and one fold. Right? So the issue is that are the collections being formed sort of reflexively incorporating um, the singular instances that, are, as we see, are interpreted in terms of a kind of theoretical framing that's been built into this aesthetics program. And that's a question, because I don't see how the, I don't have access to how these, uh, the, these um, cr uh, collections are formed. Um, the abstraction and generality of the program is something I find very problematic, and it's something I don't see to be uh, justified through evidence. It's something that actually is used to interpret the evidence, and a claim is made about the ubiquity, but I don't see how that claim can be substantiated. Uh, there's also uh, an, a presumption of that knowledge and information is somehow, even though there's recognition that you know all these different cases, whether it's trips to Palm Springs or you know how presses work in a laundry, that somehow something that's uniform, some process that's uniform of the transfer of knowledge or information is at stake here. And the, uh, you know, the model of hydraulics gives you that image, at least, of a uniform substance flowing back and forth through these uh, various uh, states of K plus or K minus. And then there's a motivation. And the motivation that's supplied for this apparatus is that there's a driving force, indeed an ultimate warrant, both of the initial utterance and of its subsequent modification, that it's epistemic, that it's, that, that it's this information transfer and this knowledge transfer, uh, at least conveying the news to otherwise unknowing recipients. And it's important for the sociology of knowledge because this is a distribution mechanism occurring at the ground. Right? Um, I see it to be uh, one of many endless instances of uh, a generalization that subsumes the particular case and to some extent shows contempt for the particular case and the uh, what Wittgenstein called in the uh, Brown book, uh, Craving for Generality. Um, so to wind this down, the demonstration in particular cases, and again, uh, the demonstration is very uh, incomplete here. There's many, many, many cases to go through. Um, that uh, what seems to be going on at the surface is informed by the assignment of this underlying epistemic state and status using the surface as an index or, or selectively as in the indexing this K minus, K minus, K plus status. 
Um, and that the assumption is that the, this, this status, once assigned, is a driving force for overt action, for declining or aborting possible, normative, expectable actions, even when they're not performed. Uh, normative status becomes, uh, that is, possibilities that are distributionally determined become normative. They become what people should do, not only what people uh, do in the run of cases when you collect similar cases together. Um, so the question that uh, I'm left with is, does the epistemics program reverse this agreement uh, between the Athenians and the Mancunians? Not the Mancunians in this room, I hope, but um, the others. Um, I don't think it's easy to answer. Again, uh, heritage uh, covers himself by disavowing, assuming a universal predilection among humans for giving and receiving information. Um, he says that there's nothing cult about what's being described that is present in plain sight as an object of massive orientation by interactions at all, interactants at all times. Uh, however, for being continuously present in plain sight, the epistemic engine can easily become a seen but unnoticed feature of interaction. He cites Garfinkel's studies in the methodology there. Um, but the epistemic do program does indeed propose that a social distribution of knowledge is, as Garfield says, to be found in and as the local achievements of the most ordinary organizational things in the world in detail. So it seems to be uh, aligned with Garfield very deeply. Uh, however, from working through these public published cases, such as those presented here, we conclude, and I mentioned my colleagues who I mentioned earlier, uh, that the EP analysis overreaches. It, often misses what seems to be perspicuous and sub sub substitutes an underlying or covert agenda for what seems to be going on the surface. Oops, is that the last one? Okay, yeah, I guess that was my last slide. <laughs> Thank you.